Minnesota got their first look at big league stars in 1961, when an American League franchise was moved here. But now, four years later, the entire baseball firmament suddenly has opened to Minnesota fans because here today are all the brightest stars of both major leagues. It's the annual All-Star Game. Willie Mays of the Giants heads a group of National Leaguers, including Billy Williams and Ernie Banks of the Cubs, Johnny Callison of the Phillies, Ed Cranepool of the Mets, and Maury Wills of the Dodgers. Sandy Koufax, the Dodger lefty, who's so brilliant, rivals say he should be in a league of his own. Cincinnati's Jim Maloney chats briefly with Koufax. Maloney once spanned eight in a row, one of the few strikeout records Sandy doesn't hold. The players get ready for batting practice. Catcher Joe Torrey of the Braves. Another Brave, Hank Aaron, takes his cuts. Next is the Phillies' Richie Allen, and also Johnny Callison. Banks starts off the Cubs, then Ron Santo, the star third baseman, and picture-swinging Billy Williams, Willie Stargell of the Pirates, Roberto Clemente, National League batting champion, Frank Robinson, Cincinnati's star slugger, Ed Cranepool of the Amazing Mets, Wills, the Dodger Swifty, stands by, Don Drysdale, the other half of the Dodgers' pair of aces, now the American Leaguers, Bobby Richardson of the Yankees, another Yankee catcher, Elston Howard, Zoilo Versailles, Minnesota's spectacular shortstop, Tony Oliva, who won the league batting title as a rookie, powerhouse Harmon Killebrew, the home run champion of the Twins, Jimmy Hall, fourth member of Minnesota's Murderer's Row, Dick McAuliffe, Detroit shortstop who hits with power, Willie Horton, a new star with Detroit, Bill Freehan, the fine young Tiger catcher, Al Kaline, Detroit's greatest star of recent years. Brooks Robinson, Baltimore's spectacular third baseman. Vic Davalio, Cleveland's fleet-footed center fielder. Gene Mock of the Phillies will lead the National Leaguers. Al Lopez of the White Sox will manage the American Leaguers. Today's contest is the 36th since the All-Star Game was inaugurated in Chicago back in 1933. And at the moment, it's dead even with each league having 17 victories so far, while one of the Midsummer Dream Games ended in a one-to-one -one deadlock in 1961 when it was stopped by rain. The umpires are at the plate, and they come to attention with the players and fans for the national anthem. With the new left field stands expanding capacity, a record crowd of 46,706 crams every inch of Metropolitan Stadium. The plate huddle breaks up, the coaches are ready, and Milt Pappas, the American League starter, takes his final warm-up pitches. Leading off for the National League is Willie Mays. On the first pitch by Pappas, Mays takes a terrific cut, but fouls it off. Here comes the second pitch, and Willie gets the fat of the bat on this one. It's deep to left center. Davileo sprints back, 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 but it's in there for a home run. A 400-foot drive. That's the third all-star homer for Mays, who has dominated these midsummer classics along with Stan Musial and Ted Williams. The homer was his 21st hit in all-star competition for a new record he previously shared with Musial. For the unhappy Pappas, it's rather a shocking start. Joe Torrey looks over the first pitch. With Willie Stargell on first and two out, Torrey ties into the next pitch and pulls it down the left field line. Gets another long blast. Willie Horton starts back toward the fence, but there's no chance. The ball sails into the seat just inside the foul pole for the second home run off Milt Pappas. Stargell, the big Pittsburgh outfielder, trots on home. And here comes Torrey into the plate to be greeted by Ernie Banks of the Cubs and Stargell. And the National League has jumped away to a 3 to nothing lead. Maury Wills is the eighth batter of the inning. Pappas keeps pumping away, and the Dodger shortstop bounces the ball straight back to the mound. The Baltimore hurler grabs it, tosses Wills out at first, and he's finally out of the inning.
Jim Mudcat Grant of the Twins goes to the mound for the American League in the second inning. The American Leaguers toss the ball around as Grant completes his warm-up pitches. With Juan Marichal on third and two out, Stargell hammers the ball into the bullpen in right center. It's a 400-foot homer for Stargell, who has developed into the big gun for the Pirates, leading them in homers as well as runs batted in. With Marichal scoring ahead of Willie, this is an important blow for the National League because it sends them winging out in front with a 5 to nothing margin. With one out in the National League third inning, Mudcat Grant strikes out Ernie Banks. Grant, Minnesota's biggest winner, seems back in the groove. Pete Rose faces him next. The Mudcat cuts loose and strikes out the Cincinnati second baseman. Batty drops the ball but throws Rose out at first. The National Leaguers take the field for the last half of the third inning. Juan Marichal, who has the highest kicking delivery in the business, warms up. The San Francisco star completes three scoreless innings, allowing the American League only one hit. Pete Rickard of Washington pitches for the American League in the fourth. And here's that man again. Willie Mays is at the plate. Under the circumstances, Batty isn't in any rush to resume action. Rickard takes his time, too, then winds up and delivers. Mays lays back for the pitch, takes that big, long stride of his and swings with terrific power. But this time, there's no contact. Wonderful Willie strikes out, which proves that he, too, is human after all. The National League still has a shutout going into the bottom of the fourth. Joe Torrey goes out to talk with Cincinnati's Jim Maloney, the National League's next pitcher. Dick McAuliffe leads off and looks to third base coach Don Gutteridge. Jim Maloney pitches and McAuliffe smashes a hit to right center field. Hank Aaron fields it rapidly and McAuliffe is held to a single. Maloney gets cautious with Harmon Killebrew. Goes to a full count, then walks the big slugger to put two men on with none out. The fastballing Maloney next faces Rocky Calavito, and the star hitter from Cleveland cracks a single to center field. It brings Dick McAuliffe charging on home with the first run of the game for the American League. With two out of the American League fifth inning, Jimmy Hall bats for Rickard and draws a walk. Maloney fires again, and McAuliffe rockets the ball deep to center. Willie Mays races back to defense and tries to climb the wire to get the ball, but it's a home run. Hall scores, and then McAuliffe comes around to the plate with Hall there to greet him. The huskily built Detroit shortstop heads for the dugout with the National League lead now only five to three. Brooks Robinson, who won the Most Valuable Player Award last year, is the next batter. And Robbie slashes the ball down the third baseline. Ron Santo rushes across and manages to get his glove on it. The ball caroms away across the foul line. Santo recovers it and gets off the long throw to first base. It hits the dirt, but the direction is perfect. And Ernie Banks grabs it cleanly. The play is close. But Robbie beats it out for a hit. Armand Killebrew steps to the plate and takes a high inside pitch. But the killer unloads on this one. And he knows it's gone, taking a look himself before shifting into his home run trot. 
Brooks Robinson adds some applause of his own as he scores. As Killebrew rounds third base, Calavito and Robbie are at the plate to greet him. Killebrew's manager, Sam Neely, coaching at first base, is sharing the joy along with the Twins' home crowd. That blast by the Minnesota Mauler has tied the score at 5-5, five to five, and Gene Mock goes out to change pitchers. Don Drysdale comes in and checks the American League rally. Sandy Koufax of the Dodgers enters the game as the National League pitcher in the sixth inning. And manager Mock gives the lineup change. The great left-hander breezes through the inning without any trouble. Sammy McDowell, Cleveland's smoke baller, loosens up for the National League seventh inning. After Willie Mays leads off the inning with a walk, McDowell tries to regain his control. Hank Aaron finds one he likes and singles into right field. Mays dashes for third and makes it easily. With two on and none out, Mock switches to the right-handed Roberto Clemente to hit for the left-handed Willie Stigel. McDowell fires and Clemente swings at a sinking pitch. Brooks Robinson cuts in front of the shortstop, scoops up the ball, and throws on the move to Bobby Richardson for a force out of Aaron at second base. Mays, who represents the lead run, returns to third, and the score remains tied. With one out now, Sato slashes a bouncer over McDowell's head. Richardson and Versailles converge on the ball. Bobby backhands it but can't hold on. It caroms toward Versailles, and it also pops out of his grasp, but he spears it on the second try. Then whirls and fires to first. He just misses getting Sato, and it's a big hit for Ron. Mays has scored, and the National League leads 6-5. With Clemente now second and Sato on first, Torrey steps to the plate. McDowell delivers and Torrey smashes the ball straight back at him. McDowell grabs it and the Cleveland lefty whirls and throws to Richardson at second in a bid for a double play. Sato is out of second. Bobby whips the ball to Killebrew and they also get Torrey and they're out of the inning. But the American League still trails six to five. Bob Gibson, who led the Cardinals to the World Championship last year, pitches in the eighth and holds the American League in check. Oliva opens the ninth with Gibson still trying to protect that slim National League lead. Gibson rifles a pitch over the outside corner and Oliva meets it perfectly. He drives it into left center. Clemente dashes across the field to field the ball. He's having trouble picking it up. He finally does and the Pittsburgh outfielder who has one of the strongest arms in the game fires into the infield. But the flying Oliva rushes into second base with a two base hit. And the American League has the tying run on second with nobody out. Gibson obviously now has his work cut out for him. Gutteridge looks for Lopez's signal. Bob Gibson pitches to Max Alvis and the Indian star tries to bunt. It's a little pop-up near the mound and Gibson calls for it himself. He grabs it for the first out. Sato can now forget about a possible sacrifice bunt. Killebrew is up next, and the killer could end it all in one swing. Gibson reaches back for something extra, and Killebrew strikes out. 
The home run slugger walks dejectedly back to the bench. And the last American League hope now is Joe Pepitone of the Yankees, who is batting for Eddie Fisher. Tension is mounting sky high. And Ernie Banks tries to relax Gibson. The partisan American League crowd still hopes for a miracle. Gibson checks the runner, fires, and Pepitone swings for strike two. Mealy reminds Pepitone he still has that big one left. Gibson concentrates on the batter. Santo takes a look at Oliva. Everybody's on his toes. The drama has reached the climax of two out and three and two on the hitter. Gibson gathers his strength for one supreme effort, and Pepitone strikes out. The National League wins a real last-ditch thriller, six to five. Joe Torrey and Ron Sato are first to congratulate Gibson on his spectacular finish. It's a glorious victory for the National League, which now leads for the first time in all-star competition. But the biggest winners of all are the millions of fans across the country who get the thrill of seeing all of baseball's superstars gathered together on one field in these annual Midsummer Classics.